Let's, let's now buckle to the topic of the day today. We're talking about devolution and the role of private sector. And we do know one of the key challenges facing the county government is how to collaborate with the private sector in actualizing devolution and ensuring its success. Since private sector players are not directly involved in matters governance, there is a need to rethink beyond the traditional understanding of the role played by private businesses in the growth of economy. In terms of governance, how do the county governments rope in the private sector to ensure there is no feeling of disengagement, especially when it comes to decision making? That's a probing question. This is where business lobby groups such as Kenya Private Sector Alliance and also the Kenya Association of Manufacturers have a role to play in ensuring the interests of the private sector are factored in or factored when it comes to drafting of business and investments friendly laws. So we're joined this morning by the chair of KEPSA, this is Nick Nasbit, and also we are joined this morning by the chair of Kenya Association of Manufacturers, Flora Mutai. We're still eagerly waiting for the Cabinet Secretary, Ministry of Devolution, that is Honorable Eugene Omala, to join us as well on this conversation because this is acting as a segue to the devolution conference that will be next week in Kakamega County, Kakamega High School. And so we want to see what actually will be in the cards when it comes to the private sector and how also since the promulgation of the constitution they have been partnering together in light of making sure that devolution is a success in this country so also remember you can head over to our twitter handle am live ntv is a twitter handle am live ntv also is a profile name on facebook and 20505 is our sms portal so let's hear from you uh, how also has the issue of delayed payments affected some of the SMEs down on the ground. So we want to hear what they really have up their collective sleeves as far as this and a lot of other issues are concerned. Good morning. Morning. Flora and Nick, good to see you. Good morning. Right, let's just get down to brass tacks and uh, we now focus especially on next week, uh, your expectation, looking at the successive or uh, conferences we had before since uh, the promulgation of a constitution. Uh, what has been some of the learning points, high spots that you've learned from these particular conferences? Or is it just, you know, a part of a system every year that we have just to do it, just to make sure that, yes, we check out and, or tick uh, the, the checklist uh, boxes? The bell, that is harsh. It is harsh. <laughs> that is harsh. <laughs> I think, um, to be fair to the country, devolution is very new to us. It's yes. only five years old. So therefore, it is important every time, as, as, you know, when you prepare any strategy, it's important to always sit back and take a review what yes. has actually been happening. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll give you a case in point. We were reviewing um, what, what the, the, the counties have sort of been investing in, in development funds. Yes. And it's, it's supposed to be something about 30%. But mm -hmm. over the last five years, very few of them have gotten close to that. Yes. Although towards the end of last year, now we're starting to see a tipping scale. So as much as you have these, these, these conferences and you're, you're able to expose you know, the, the, the counties to what is expected of them and what, what the opportunities are mm -hmm. and for, for the private sector and the business people to also say what their challenges are, including national government in the conversation. I think all you can do is improve mm -hmm. and be able to drive devolution and, and actually make it achieve what it was supposed to achieve, which is bring, you know, bring, bringing um, closer to the one entry. Mm -hmm. Are you privy to the theme that is running under this particular conference in Kakabega? Not particularly. Not no. particularly. No. All right. Let's hear from uh, Nick. Good morning. Good to see you. Good morning. Good to see you too. Yes. So when I look at these conferences, um, every year you remain optimistic that it's going to be taken up to a whole new level. Yes. And we will see the progress during the year. And, and there is progress. I think, as Flora was saying, for the first few years, there was a lot of settling in. Mm -hmm. What does this mean to now be a governor, a deputy governor? And you could see a lot of the challenges that they faced in managing budgets, ensuring that there was transparency ensuring that they could appoint the right people or the right qualifications. And you can see the maturity of that process. Mm -hmm. So with this year, we come in uh, with a new government, new expectations. There's the big four. Yes. There's the big attention that you're getting from the people. There's a big drive and an expectation for public participation. One Angie want to have a say in what happens in their county. And so as private sector, we look forward with great anticipation for this conference because so many of the things that uh, are going to uplift the economy are going to be done by private sector, in particular the small businesses, and all of that work is being done in the counties. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a pivotal week next week, and we look forward to having very engaging and fruitful discussions with the government 
and the county government mm -hmm. as to what they're going to do over the next year. Right, a pivotal week, but also the pivotal question is the fact that uh, so many people are feeling that, uh, yes, we do have the, the 47 counties right now, but this also is really straining, you know, the exchequer in terms of making sure that uh, they're well funded. The issue of money has been a crippling factor also in running these particular counties. And so there's a whole debate of whether maybe we should go back to the table and try and scale down on the number of counties that we do have in, the, in, this, in this country. Do we need these 47 counties in the first place? Should also that be maybe uh, a, a very pivotal question that should be addressed in this particular conference? I do not know. In the private sectors, I mean, what, what is the, the, uh, the private sector thinking about the, the whole counties? Or is it good business for private sector? No, no, it, it, it is difficult to deal with 47, 47 counties, but I don't feel a conference like this is actually the place. This is a conversation, A, that needs to be had. It is, it is true mm -hmm. that it is a strain on, on the whatever, but I don't think it is for us to have it in this one. In this one, what we're trying to do is to actually take dev devolution deeper. You know, have, have the public tell the county governments, this is what we expect. Tell, tell private sector, business people to actually engage so that they can, dri they can drive business and make it happen. I believe, like I said, it's, it's, it's an important conversation, but I'm, I'm not necessarily sure this is the place to have it. Right, but for more honest estimation, maybe I should hear also your thought before we go to the next question, uh, Nick. Well, 47 counties, I think that's a lot. Mm -hmm. I think that's a lot. It's a lot. And, and, it's, and it's very difficult for people to even to know who the 47 uh, leaders of those counties are. And when you look at it, uh, the, the whole point is we're trying to build, build, lift up the welfare of the citizens of that region. And I've met with governors in my role as Kepsa, numerous governors, mm -hmm. talking to them. And uh, to be honest, when I sit and I ask them, what is the unique value proposition of your county? Why should we go to your county? Because if you, in many cases, they don't have an airport, they don't have a road, they mm -hmm. don't have a port. Um, they don't have any large companies that they can uh, point to who are going to drive the tax base or increase employment. Mm -hmm. Um, the number of paved roads, and so on and so on and so on. So they, many of the counties don't have a critical mass mm -hmm. to actually create something. And if they were part of a larger block, and therefore I think the conversation that is being had around should we have larger inter-county trading blocks or governing blocks, I think that one, that's one that should be explored during these next few years. Mm -hmm. And it comes back to why should a private sector company move to a particular county and invest there? And there are a whole raft of um, uh, issues that need to be resolved. And what I told one of the governors as we had this discussion last week was that perhaps the greatest selling point mm -hmm. for, the, for the county that he leads was himself and his team. Mm -hmm because this was a governor that was very switched on, knew what they had to do, and mm -hmm. so on and so on. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of conversation that private sector wants to have with governors. But it's tough to do it with the 47. It's tough to do it's it with the 47. It 47. Mm -hmm. And it's tough for these counties to actually have enough mass mm -hmm. to create a viable economic and social community. All right. Maybe, Flora, from your own estimation, how will you characterize uh, the relationship that you do have, uh, you as a private sector, and uh, the counties as well, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I know also uh, payment is uh, one big issue. Yes. Yes, but uh, has this in any way also affected your relationship with the counties in terms of you being can shy to offer more services to the counties? Okay. We do face several um, challenges with the counties. And um, one, one of them, of course, is just, um, okay, let me explain. For manufacturing to be conducive, yes. we, need, we, we need sort of like to drive down competitiveness, co which is cost of doing business, mm -hmm. you know, from energy to multiple charges and everything. And, and devolution has actually, as much as we appreciate it, it has yes. actually made it more expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, um, you have um, cesses, you have distribution, transportation, branding licenses. So a, lo a lot of these, the cost of doing business has been driven among the counties. Mm -hmm. and, and, and of course, as a manufacturer, you want to reduce um, tariff, they're called you know, non-tariff barriers. First of all, we talk about it usually in foreign countries, getting mm -hmm. into foreign countries, but now it is within Kenya. So, it, so definitely it has been a challenge for um, private, private sector and mm -hmm. for manufacturing to, to thrive within, within um, the devolution. But we've been having a lot of engagements with them. And that is why you heard Nick re refer to like private participation is one of the things mm -hmm. we've been requesting that actually um, we need to have a bit more of. Previously, you would just perhaps open the newspaper and see, oh, there's a, there, 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 there's a function out in Kisumu and mm -hmm. we're discussing ABCD. You have less than 24 hours to mm -hmm. actually react. So mm -hmm. we go there, 
if we have, uh, get there on time, ill-prepared. So what we've taken an approach is, is more a more proactive approach mm -hmm. where we've gone round, you know, um, sat, sat with most of the 47 counties yes. and, and give them, given them what we require and they then are in return um, telling us what, how, how they work, mm -hmm. help them sort of capacity build, help them under, understand what, what, what is important to us. You know, we need a pro-industry policy. We cannot have, um, like recently in Mombasa, you saw the tea being hit with a 32 shilling tax on each bag. Yes. I mean, um, that is, that, that is um, against business, definitely, because a lot of the 60 or 90% 90, 90 of all tea traded in, um, moves around within Mombasa. You can't have that. You can't have a, a governor waking up and saying, this is what we're going to do. So it is important for us to have a predictive and stable environment. It is important to, for us to drive down the cost of doing business. Um, it's important for circulation of money. That is a very, very big one. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there was this whole thing about youth, women and children sort of now starting to supply not only national government, mm -hmm. but county government. Yes. And we do know that in both of them, actually, um, money has been delayed. Circulation of money nationally, obviously, now has been redu has reduced for several factors, you know, inc including interest rate capping, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that has also hindered, especially the SME, um, because they're not they don't have access to funds. Uh, some of them then supplied to um, the counties or the national government, and now have gone bust. I've met a lot of companies that have said it is easier for me to go back to work. And these are people we're trying to say we want to develop SMEs, but the minute you don't have money circulating, they don't have the fundamentals. Of business, which you know, capital being one of the major ones, you know, they're they're they're, they're, they're quitting. We have a we have a youth um, challenge already. We have an employment at 39.1 percent. Mm -hmm. You know, mainly youth. Yes. We have a social a social problem. We have, I mean, it is a dangerous problem that we need to you know we need to deal with. Mm -hmm. We need to empower people in the right manner mm -hmm. by giving them the stable envi environment. Export. Um, we need to develop an export-driven economy. We have counties that are blessed with a lot of natural resources. You know, if we take a county like um, Nakuru, you know, they're able to grow. They're able to grow. Let's say the flowers, Naivasha. They're able to grow, grow the flowers. How can we improve that to actually drive exports? You know, we need to move up the value chain. If you have um, Nyandara growing a lot of potatoes, but during a high heavy season, a lot of this sort of it just gets um, lost. How do we sit with them and drive the value, drive up the value chain? What can we do with these potatoes? How do we get them out? Mm -hmm. Do we, ex you know, how do we export them, or how do we um, um, add add value? Um, so those are the sort of the things we are sort of trying to achieve when we are saying, let's sit down, um, explain to you our issues, we listen to yours, and together we are going to be able to grow. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. And allow me to introduce to you again, if you're joining us this morning, Nick Nesbitt, who is the chair of KEPSA. And also we do have with us the chair of Kenya Association of Manufacturers. This is Flora Mutai. Uh, and we continue with the conversation at pace uh, as far as devolution is concerned. And just to remind you that this is acting as a, as a segue to the conference, that, which is upcoming next week in Kakamega, the devolution conference, where all the entire uh, devolved government will be in Kakamega to thrash out matters as far as devolution is concerned, ironing out the wrinkles and the kinks that we do have when it comes to devolution. Right, let, let's come to you because we promised our viewers that uh, we'll talk about the long dead hand of the bureaucracy and the ease of doing business, the environment itself. When it really comes to counties, how has been your your, your experience so far, as far as duplication of functions is concerned, national government, county government? So, good question. You know, when people talk about the uh, duplicity, when they talk about the duplication, I should say, of bureaucracy, yes. ironically, what you expect with bureaucracy is predictability, but you actually don't get that. You get very unpredictable payment terms, very unpredictable, yes. <coughs> excuse me, forms of taxation, very unpredictable um, implementation of laws. For business people, it doesn't matter whether you're a small company or one of the largest companies uh, nationally or globally, what you're trying to do is reduce your risk. Mm -hmm. And your risk is really unsettled once you don't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking for from the counties is for them to live up to what they have written down as to what they're going to do on paper. Yes. And what we see is uh, very frequently that not happening. Um, Flora was mentioning uh, about payments. Yes. It is becoming increasingly challenging for companies to actually get financing mm -hmm. based on 
revenue that they're expecting from counties because of that unpredictability. And the banks and the financial institutions really have a hard time with that. Companies that are looking to go and do business with counties, I've even experienced it myself in, in my professional capacity, where you're chasing money um, just on and on and on, and mm -hmm. you have to designate people to keep going. Debt and it goes from the governor to the county executive to the governors, to, and, and that is just madness. Mm -hmm. So if the counties want to grow, uh, which they want to do, and they want to attract investment, they have to really focus on this predictability. And what comes along with that is governance. We as KEPSA and uh, Association of Manufacturers yes. have had our members sign basically documents that say thou shalt follow the law and not do anything that they shouldn't be. We need counties to institute um, policies such as that which say there will not be any uh, corruption, there's the Anti-Bribery Act that needs to be put in place, and there needs to be consequences for people that uh, fail to perform. Mm -hmm. And failing to perform is also something that the governors really need to push on themselves. I would also say that um, when we look at what is happening in counties yes. and, and the duplication, there's a tremendous amount of paperwork, mm -hmm. paperwork. And especially in my role at, at IBM, yes. we and many other companies are big advocates for digitization. Mm -hmm. I know the president has said that this is the digital presidency. We need to get on with it. The counties have budgets. They're very large budgets, very large budgets for computerization, digitization. Yes. They need to start implementing. Mm -hmm. And they need to collaborate with the national government. The Ministry of ICT, the ICT Authority, have plans that are underway around the national ICT policy. That must include the counties. The counties must be aware of it. And we must ensure that, again, we're not creating parallel systems or duplication systems, which make the bureaucracy even worse. Mm -hmm. So I would say, above all, what we're looking for as businesses is to reduce the risk, increase the predictability of what happens when you engage with the counties. And we're just looking for people to keep their word so that we can all do business and uplift the counties. Mm -hmm. All right, and I think uh, also when we, we had a session here with Flora and uh, we'd mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, the growth of uh, the manufacturing sector mm -hmm. seemed to be actually on a steep decline as mm -hmm. opposed to where it was uh, at a stagnation at uh, 10%. Uh, uh, but right now, even that 10% is, is, is reducing, it's going down. Is in any way the county government also uh, contributing to this particular factor? And if it is, then in what way? Um, first of all, let me make a disclaimer. Um, manufacturing has over historically been contributing 10% to the GDP. Mm -hmm. However, the GDP has been growing. So we have been growing, but I guess, I guess other sectors are growing faster than we are growing. Mm -hmm. So like we said last year, we did have a dip to 9.2% um, you know, of, of GDP. Yes. But of course now with the big four, um, manufacturing has been, has, has been zeroed in as one of the areas mm -hmm. where we are going to try and um, you know, improve um, the environment. And again, I go back to the three things that uh, manufacturers really require to, to succeed in business, which is a, a competitive environment. The cost of doing business for a manufacturer cannot be um, underestimated. Down from the cost of energy, mm -hmm. you know, um, then the licenses. We, we, um, we were moving towards a single business um, permit. Right now, with the devolution, we do have a lot of um, multiple taxes, mm -hmm. and they become unpredictable taxes. You know, um, a, a, a guy just wakes up and says, I, I saw you um, offloading over there. This van is registered in this other county, mm -hmm. ETC, ETC. Now, what tends to happen as manufacturers is, A, you're not very keen to go into those counties. B, mm -hmm. you, and, um, you, you then just start loading up these costs, which raises, again, the standard of living, and which is against what we are trying to achieve. We are mm -hmm. trying to reduce the standard of living and, and, and actually alleviate poverty. So that is another area that we really um, need to achieve. Um, again, we, we cannot underscore the unpredict unpredict unpredictability of mm -hmm. policy. Mm -hmm. You know, it is important for us to be able to say in the next couple of months, in the next couple of years, as opposed to, you know, in June, this new law is coming. Mm -hmm. In July, something else is coming. You know, it, it becomes difficult to attract not only local investment, which is what the whole idea of devolution is. Yes. They're trying to build competitiveness so that, you know, you can attract companies to actually come and, and raise your tax base. But again, now, if this happens, we not only have local investments shying away, also foreign investments. And if you look at the Big Four agenda, we, we did a rough calculation. We look, we, to contribute 15% 
um, to the GDP will require manufacturing to grow at 36% year on year. Mm -hmm. Well, somewhere between 30 and 36% year on year, which is a huge figure. Yes. Um, meaning all these issues that we keep complaining about, logisti logistics, infrastructure, you know, ICT, like Nick talked about, these are things that almost need to become a given, you know, and, and when we do have challenges, we need to be able to sit in a room quickly and say, we understand where you're coming from, we understand where you're coming from, and sort of ironing it out. I'll give you a case in point. We just had the plastic ban. I think we were here on the show discussing yes, yes, the yes. plastic ban with you. Um, the plastic ban came in and, we, uh, you know, within six months, we are banning plastics. Majority of plastics is used, they, there is the single user um, carrier bag, but there is a lot that is used in, 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 in the industrial processes. If a lot of our, our a lot, I mean, I do know, a lot of our manufacturers have machines that are imported that come, you know, perhaps do, they, they do filming, they, they do the top on, on whatever, they label in plastic, they, they wrap, they shrink wrap in plastic. How are those companies supposed to sort of transition within mm. such a short period of time? Six months is not practical. You know, let, let's not mention, of course, we were trying to, 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 to say, why don't we deal with single user mm -hmm. um, plastic bags, but allow, uh, allow this. So with collaboration and partnership, we, um, the government will perhaps be able to tell us, this is what we're trying to achieve. Of course, environment does not, has not gone away. We're able, we should be able to sit down with the Ministry of Environment and say, this is what I'm trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. We'll be able to say, this is the challenge and this is why, why it stops us. So find a mediation as we are dealing with a long-term problem. Thank you. Right, and of course, uh, we want now to get down to it right now, uh, just to also prime you on the rules of engagement that we do have here every Friday on the, uh, on the Leadership Forum. I do have my bell. I have also uh, my time watch as well, which is, will be on my phone. And also, just to remind you that you have your microphone tethered on you, right? So when you're going to the lectern, there's another mic uh, waiting for you. So you will head over there and talk to Kenyans. We're given five to six minutes to speak about devolution and the private sector. How has the relationship been? And the, the question also again is, uh, how do we uh, kink out some of you know, the challenges, the wrinkles that we do have as far as devolution is concerned? And I know more, uh, most of the things you've said here, but I do know so you have a lot that you have to tell Kenyans without me interrupting and interjecting and butting in with questions, just to give you a quick, uh, a seamless flowing thought of of, of, your, of your preparation on what you do have this morning for us. So I'm going to use the bell just uh, to give you, I'll give you six minutes. Midway, I'm going to raise it. So don't get startled and start winding up, right, while you're on the lectern. But towards the end, I'm going to shake it a bit or try and uh, sway it a bit so that now you can be warned, that, yes, you should be wrapping up, right? So if you go over and beyond, I'll ring the bell. So we'll begin with you, Nick. Uh, you'll just walk over to the lectern over there. Your camera is camera three, just straight on. Of course, uh, you can speak to, you get the chance actually to address the nation this morning uh, as far as the role of the private sector is concerned. So Nick is the chair of KEPSA and of course also is the general manager of the IBM East Africa. And he's going to give us his thought this morning about devolution and the role of private sector, some of the challenges they've been experiencing, some of the successes as well, and how also we can try and harmonize this particular relationship moving forward. Remember also you can hit us on Twitter, AM Live NTV. We'll remain as always our Twitter handle and AM Live NTV is a profile name on Facebook. Let's get hearing from you. We shall be reading some of your tweets uh, also on our social media as well. Nick, you have six minutes beginning now. Thank you. And uh, good morning, listeners. As I begin this morning, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and be able to address what the private sector has stated as the issues that they see in engaging with counties. And when we look at our role, first of all, the private sector is uh, the, the main generation of investors, uh, of, of investments, and our role is to create value and provide access to goods, access to services. Our role is to ensure that we can improve the social and economic value of um, the people in our regions and our communities. We're really focused as well on opening up trade and investment opportunities, generating wealth, creating jobs, and participating in county development. Kenya's private sector actually represents about 80% of the GDP, and it's the key pillar an engine of economic growth. And almost 70% of all formal employment is held within the private sector. And our businesses are primarily made up of micro and small enterprises, MSMEs, and there are about 15 million of them today. So therefore, when we look at 
our role as KEPSA, we have to be absolutely committed to ensuring that devolution works. Our members are spread out all over the counties, and what people often forget is that everything in, Ke in Kenya actually happens in a county. So it's very critical for us that the work that is being done by the governors and by the Ministry of Devolution is really focused on ensuring that the policies get implemented. So in, in that uh, vein, when we look at our role as KEPSA, it is really to work with the, uh, the Ministry of Devolution, is to work with the county of governors and the county executive committees, is to work with the Senate through the speakers' roundtables and the devolution sector board and all the other relevant stakeholders that are involved in devolution. So people often ask, what are the areas in which the uh, county government must focus on to enhance the role of private sector? And there are many of them. Um, and I won't list all of them that uh, frequently come to mind, but I would say it's a point that we were talking about a few minutes ago, and that's really about improving the predictability. Improving the predictability of the policy and the business regulations and the frameworks that are used to govern the counties. It's also really important that the public has a say in what happens in their counties. It's interesting to see how uh, social media is really taking off, and if a governor is uh, not doing what is expected, social media lights up. But it's not about social media, it's about active engagement by the public. I think some of the challenges that uh, uh, businesses face is just the bureaucracy, as we were talking about earlier, and there are great opportunities for digitization. Really important that the county governments implement their ERP systems and ensure that there are online portals and that e-citizen services are available to all. The unpredictability of the taxation means that there are random checks, people suddenly get taxed for things that they weren't expecting. I think what counties really should do is have a go-to-market strategy on how to, to attract businesses. And that means come up with innovative revenue raising schemes, such as build your industrial parks, build your agro-processing parks, attract manufacturers, create wealth, and create a greater velocity of money. But to make sure your county is actually connected to a greater economy, the roads, the infrastructure are critical. There are huge gaps in uh, what it takes to deliver something uh, from one county to the next. And with all these um, challenges on infrastructure, that needs to be fixed. People look at the roads that are not working, and the first thing they think about is there's not enough money, and perhaps the second, or even the first thing they think about, is there are some loopholes in governance, and there must be wastage of public resources. Big challenge, and it's very important for the counties to ensure that they're putting on the right face when it comes to that. The counties, many of them, 47, so many of them are very small. We believe, as a KEPSA, that there's an inter-county agenda that must be explored and pushed further and have larger trading blocks across the counties. And as you trade in these counties, of course, it's about reducing risk, and that means that security. We don't talk about it very much, but going back to the rural areas used to be something that was just a very pleasant experience. In many cases, the security is very challenging. So I think at the end of the day, what we're really looking for is a full implementation of the policies, the policies that are in place today, and a, a very clear tie-up between the county government's strategies and the big four. The agenda for the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, uh, is about the big four, and we need to see that implemented well. And as we look at how the companies uh, who are looking to invest in these counties can do business, there's this whole issue everybody always talks about, PPPs. It has not been clearly implemented, and we need to get creative as to how we can implement uh, PPPs to attract investment into the counties. As KEPSA, we are frequently entertaining uh, international investors, local investors, who are looking for opportunities. Recently, some investors traveled around Kenya, and they said, Kenya looks like a blank sheet of paper. If you think you've done anything today, you barely have scratched the surface. Yeah. They're looking to invest in counties. They're looking to bring their agro-processing in particular, and another company bring their steel into the counties. But the engagement um, must be uh, clarified. 
So I think what everybody really cares about at the end of the day, and I will at end at this point, is ensuring that they get paid for the work they do and they get paid on time and that they really have a lower risk environment when they go to do business in the counties. And that's all we're looking for. Thank you and everybody have a good morning. Thank you, Nick. Nasbid there, the chair of CAPSA and also uh, the general manager of IBM East Africa, raising some salient points that we've taken note of and will be discussing also with him as well. Uh, the tweet, it is instructive to note that yet 80% uh, of the GDP really comes from the private sector, very pivotal uh, role they do play and what are some of the county uh, focus that maybe they should uh, look upon. Uh, we have a whole Actually, he's enumerated some of them. I, sh I shall just pick one or two of them. Improving the predictability, uh, of course, of doing uh, the business through the policies uh, in the counties. Uh, he says that social media also uh, should take off and uh, uh, bureaucracy uh, and great opportunity for business uh, systems like uh, enterprise resource planning and e-citizen. Also, go-to-market strategy. Uh, industrial parks, that is also pivotal when it comes to making sure that, yes, business really thrives within the county. Inter-county agenda, uh, that is big, and how does it interface also and uh, tie up also uh, with the big four agenda that the pre President Huru uh, Kenyatta just declared uh, some few months back, right? That is from Nick Nesbitt. Remember also, you, need, you can interrogate with them on social media. AM Live NTV is our Twitter handle. AM Live NTV is a profile name on Facebook. And 20505 is our SMS portal. Right now, also walking up to the podium, just uh, now is uh, Flora Motai. She is the CEO of Melvin T. And also, she is a chair of Kenya Association of Manufacturers. And she's going to talk to us also on her perspective, especially from the manufacturing sector which has been also uh, encumbered with so many challenges as far as you know the smooth flow of business is concerned the cost of energy has been spiking and how can also the devolved government come in and try and you know ameliorate some of these challenges that they do face down on the ground so flora you have five, let me try and reset also my my stopwatch here so that i can uh, give you exactly six, six minutes beginning now all right good morning on this cold morning, although I didn't see rain this morning. Um, industrialization has been recognized as um, basically a, a, a big driver in economic growth. And actually very few developed countries can actually say that they have developed without manufacturing being one of their main pillars of growth. And the reason being is because manufacturing is, 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 is very deep rooted. It is the muscle behind um, employment. It creates real jobs which then have, a, 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 um, with a lot of um, backward and forward linkages, with an opportunity for wealth generation. Uh, sorry, sorry. Competitive manufacturing is, is all about creating an enabling business environment, and that is what we strive to do at Kenya Association of Manufacturing. The manufacturers, the contribution of the manufacturing sector to Kenya has been, like we mentioned earlier, 10%. Um, last year it went actually to 9.1%, uh, employing around uh, approximately about 300,000 people. The current government, as we know, has prioritized manufacturing in the Big Four agenda to contribute 15% to the GDP, which is a, 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 a huge target. And as industry, we applaud them, and as, we um, as it will transform the lives of Kenyans through job and wealth creation and improve a lot of the quality of lives which is important, like I mentioned earlier, considering the big bulge in um, 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 youth population and with a 39.1% of them being unemployed. And as come, we are keen to see manufacturing centralized in our national and county visions um, towards achieving an inclusive political economy. Though devolution, through devolution, industries continue to enjoy services closer to them, there's no doubt that it has achieved a positive impact However, there are areas, certain areas that do need to improve. And in order to re reap the benefits of devolution, we must begin to look at counties as the future engines for growth. It is also evident that political tension in our country will continue to be made worse by social economic inequalities if county leadership do not actually take on this mantle. There's no better time than now to harness the potential of the manufacturing sector in creating shared economic values and um, sustainable um, for sustainable economic solutions. However, many of the counties have not given the importance of to the industrialization agenda 
in their development plans. And like I, I, a lot of them have not conceptualized or matched out their development priorities or clearly articulated them in their sector plans. As a matter of fact, and um, we, d we have been um, checking, they, according to the Public Finance uh, Management Act, they are required to put 30% of, the, of, of their funds into development funds. And over the last five years, I, I mentioned this earlier, um, we, you know, there were, a lot of them were below this, although towards six, year 16 and seven, 2016 and 17, we did see sort of like a, a marginal um, growth, um, which has surpassed the 30%. Last year's industry, together, we identified 10 priority areas to focus in, in each of the sectors. Um, we went around and we had, a, you know, we shared our vision with them. During, again, the gubernatorial debates, um, we engaged each of them in, in uh, carving out what, what are their competitive, competitive advantages and what, um, what needs to be addressed for us to be able to drive manufacturing. And um, we actually distilled that recently to just five pillars, um, and one of, you know, which are creating a competitive environment, having a level playing field for local manufacturing, promoting exports, um, developing policies and institutional frameworks to drive, to nurture industrial growth and have with a special focus to SME and skills development. What is required, again, to, um, to, re um, to re we must look at all the time what is required to spark manufacturing. And the first one, of course, is driving competitiveness. We shall never get tired of, of saying this. Why we say this is we have a help desk at KAM um, where we record the amount of issues that people call in. And we have noticed over 60% of the complaints that come in are county related. My van has been um, you know, um, caught with perishable goods. What am I supposed to do? I didn't know about this license. This is new. This was not communicated. So cost of doing business, especially you know, industrial inputs and um, logistics, that's important. Multiple charges, levies, and fees by counties still remain a challenge. The lack of a single business permit to, we would like to see sort of like a harmonization of permits. So like the source, perhaps you pay, you, you pay, you pay in this, your originating county and they find a mechanism to sort of distribute it among themselves. Of course, unpredictability policy environment that we had mentioned a lot and infrastructure challenges, you know, water, sewage, among others. For example, um, you know, um, en environment has become a devolved, um, environmental waste management has become a devolved function. And those are areas we do need to partner. Counties are blessed with natural resources that should be leveraged on to foster a strong manufacturing base. And in order to address these challenges, the county government and the business com um, um, community must continue to forge these partnerships that will see some of the following frameworks and me um, measured and developed. Number one, we must have an innovative waste management measure to promote a circular economy. The second one is to address infrastructure challenges in the county. There should be a private public framework between counties and the business communities um, with manufacturing. Stakeholder participation framework that will allow manufacturers to participate in lawmaking and policy generation. We must have a national regulatory framework that will address the issues of multiple taxes. And we want counties to set up industrial parks, land parks, land parks, special economic zones to promote um, business. Long-term financial um, models must be supported for the, to support manufacturing startups. Um, we would like to partner with them to sort of drive the agro-processing of raw materials because we are an ag agricultural-based um, economy and we must improve the effectiveness of the county regional blocks. As I conclude, counties are no longer the future of this country. They are the present solution to our economic frailties. The concept of devolution to distribute wealth and resources to each and every citizen while imparting a sense of belonging and, and ownership can materialize if we build a strong manufacturing base in every county. And if I could finish with a quote from Jack Ma, he actually mentioned that the world needs new leadership but the new leadership is about working together. Thank you and good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Flora Matai, the CEO of Melvin T, and also the chairperson of Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Of course, yes, the world needs new leaders. And uh, a quote there from uh, Jack Ma. Well, how did it end again? It just eluded me. Mm -hmm. Oh, we need, we need new leaders. Let me get it correct. Um, we need new leaders, and, it's, and the leadership is about working together. It's about it's about partnership, it's and of course, this is the conversation that is ongoing. Of course.
here on AM Live. It's all about partnership, uh, devolution, and the role of private sector, social leadership in inequalities. This is uh, one of the points that uh, she's raised from her, of course, presentation th this morning. And marginal growth that has been experienced, especially when we hack back to 2016, this was a big challenge as well. And uh, that also has been on a steep decline, uh, if you may go with the recent data and statistics as well. Policy and institutional frameworks with special focus on SMEs, uh, they've of course, with the introduction of the interest caps, uh, that particular sector has been adversely affected. And we can see new development that they want to repeal this particular uh, you know, act. And it seems also the, the president is buckling down to the pressure that is coming from uh, also this, the private sector. That also will be, be part of a topic that we'll be exploring this morning as well. Innovative way of waste management is another key uh, point that we need to look as far as devolution is concerned down and uh, the private-public uh, partnership when it comes also to, yes, solid waste management as well. National regulatory framework, all this, if we don't have a proper, a proper framework, I should say, that also will really not really function properly. And uh, we would just want to also hear from some of uh, the tweets that are coming through this morning uh, to just uh, see also what some of you are saying. Let's just begin with uh, John Gedange saying, the cost of doing business in Kenya is too high compared to other East African countries like Rwanda. Uh, this is due to unreasonable red tape measures, high taxation, and runaway graft in county offices. John Gidanga there. Also, we have Mugu saying, it will take more than ideas for young people to realize their full potential. Government support is key. And also, we have Ben Charlie saying that um, delayed payments and delayed VAT refunds killing the SME sector even when it comes to uh, devolution as well. We have also Bing Charlie con saying that uh, devolution is working slowly. Meaningful conversation around Ugatuzi is healthy, but we must implement resolutions. Also, Jacob uh, Abere Matslala is saying, just want to be contrary of uh, what Flora is saying. It is, easy to deal, it is easy to deal with counties, or it is easy to deal with counties. Why? We have oversight, oversight role of count, count, count uh, should be county, county assemblies and senate on financial and HR management. So conference gonna be a panacea in appraisal. I don't know if it makes any leaks of sense to you uh, what uh, Jacob Berry is is talking about. And uh, we have John Gidanga saying that uh, I think I dread that. Let me try and pick another one. Oh, he's just actually also appraising leadership forum is saying uh, is one of my favorite. Uh, AM Live's a breakfast show. It's always inspirational, motivational, encouraging, and captivating. Give it up. Uh, thank you uh, to you, John Gidanga, uh, thanking our team here. So let's just get down to business as well and address some of these issues that you've raised. Beginning with you, Nesbit, uh, you raised um, issues that we want to tackle as well with you. The main generation uh, of investment, 80% of the GDP really comes from the private sector. Interesting. And... Uh, You've also mentioned some of these areas that we need to tackle, uh, improving the predict, pred, uh, predict. predictability of policy. And social media, I think also this will take up, uh, your, you'll pick your interest as well, because I think yeah, you're in that sector. And uh, we want to know, uh, especially when it comes to social media and let's say also digitization of processes within the counties as well. Lands from the national perspective has gone full steam ahead to do that. But I think also uh, the, the uptake is slow when it comes to counties as well. But it will be prudent when we have uh, systems which are actually digitized all, uh, in all the counties as well. What is you, uh, what, or, uh, what are you doing as a private sector, and especially IBM, in maybe collaborating also with government in trying to maybe to streamline, making sure that we have, we have Wi-Fi's, we have counties like Nakuru, I do know, they've actually gone full steam ahead as well to introduce Wi-Fi as well, and how will that also contribute to the ease of doing business, the cost Thank of data? Thank you, that's, that's, a, that's a good question, because IT is a small word, but it's a very big topic. So when you look at the layers of IT, yes. The first layer, what they call layer one, is all about the transport layer, and that's about access. So what's very important, and the government is doing this, is to ensure that there is high-speed access, internet access, in as many parts of the country as they can. Mm -hmm. When you layer on top of that the fiber, then you get the Wi-Fi. Yes. That, between the fiber and the Wi-Fi and what people are bringing to your home and so on in the offices, that is what gives you access to all of this content. So the, uh, the other part that the ICT ministry is pushing is for local content. 
And local content means not only what you get out of creative media and so on, but also what you're doing with that local content. It could be e-citizen, it could be government records and so on. But at the end of the day, people don't necessarily want to go to the internet just for entertainment. They want to use the internet, they want to use access to services to improve their businesses and improve their lives. This is where it gets very interesting. It gets very interesting because so many of the processes that we are engaged in today are paper, paper-based, which means that people are walking all over town and are getting on public transport or private transport to go to a destination where that document can be processed. And then they have to do the manual carrying mm -hmm. of brown envelopes, whatever color they are, yes. from one organization to the next. That whole process can be digitized. It can be digitized. And we, as IBM, and as I said earlier, other companies are working with the government to try and take a holistic approach to that. Mm -hmm. The Minister, Ministry of Trade and Industry, Aidan Mohammed, they're really pushing ease of doing business. Yes. We, as IBM, have worked very hard with them to take some of these processes, simplify them, streamline them, and you can see how our rankings have improved tremendously. Mm -hmm. But to really have the people feel a difference, we have to take it further, and that's what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that all of these processes that people are running around doing can now be digitized. The workflow, the processes can be mapped, tracked from the comfort of your own home or your own transportation. You can see where your document is, and you can accomplish what you're trying to get done. If you take all of those processes, that's great, you can get it done. But now you need to bring trust to the equation. And that's again where mm -hmm. we are getting very involved with trying to bring trust to the digital network. Mm -hmm. And the way you can bring trust is using technology. And most recently as IBM, we've been pushing blockchain. Mm -hmm. This is a word that is increasingly being uh, talked about uh, in Kenya today. And we are uh, very active on that. What blockchain does is ensure that these processes that you're going through um, are actually legitimate and the documents you're dealing with and the people you're dealing with are legitimate. And the process you can use, uh, you're using, can be done a lot faster. Mm -hmm. We have just uh, taken an implementation of that and announced it this week, where we're working with a company, Twiga Foods, a local company, that distributes vegetables from smallholder families, farmers, I mean, to small uh, retailers. They're sort of a business to business. But using blockchain, we've enabled um, data to be collected about the shopkeeper and about the farmer which will give them um, a, a greater ability to get credit mm -hmm. because now you can see what their turnover is like the frequency of borrowing the frequency of paying you can see their transaction history all of that is stored in the blockchain as a permanent record mm -hmm. and the banks insurance companies, transporters, agriculture, all of these people, think of a WhatsApp group, are in a community watching what's happening in real time. Mm -hmm. And you know there's a permanent record. And now people can say, ah, I trust that farmer. I trust that retailer. I know they have predictability in their business and I can lend to them. So it's innovations like that, which you're doing in the private sector on a very small level that brings trust to the equation that can help elevate uh, people participating in the cities mm -hmm. or in the counties and elevate their businesses. When you bring blockchain to land, you can make sure that that title that you're buying has been certified and it is true. When you go to buy it, mm -hmm. we know that that is actually you and it is certified. Mm -hmm. When I go get my uh, high school certificate and my grades, that's certified. So all across the country, we are trying to bring certification, a single source of truth about almost any process, any person, any asset. And therefore, anytime you engage with anybody digitally, if the blockchain is behind it, you'll be able to trust it. Mm -hmm. Now think what that's going to do to the brand of Kenya for local and international investors when you know that that piece of land that you're going to build a plant on to generate uh, employment and steel actually belongs to that landholder, mm -hmm. and so on and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's what we are doing. And that is the future of technology, but the future of technology is actually now, mm -hmm. and it's happening, 
and the task force that Dr. Demo is leading is very actively engaged, looking for use cases at the port and everywhere, mm -hmm. how we can transform. And we hope also uh, from the task force it will not just be on the national uh, policy level, but also this will be also a big chunk of discussion also with the devolution conference because I think it's a noble idea, a very winsome one, but also uh, sometimes we lag behind in time in, in trying to implement, we come up with good uh, tax forces reports, but the implementation also is a different kettle of fish altogether. Yeah. And she's talked about policy and institutional framework with a special focus on SMEs. SMEs have been affected and we, we talk about SMEs, we are looking at the counties where most of them right now, even they're watching today, because uh, they've been crippled they're, as far as uh, access to financing is concerned, mm -hmm. especially with the, with the interest uh, rate caps where mm -hmm. the banks also became a bit, uh, you know, gun shy to lend to, you know, small and uh, medium enterprises mm -hmm. because they feel, uh, you know, the rate of uh, bad debt also has been rising as well. Or maybe just to hit back at uh, the government that, yes, we want to just lo uh, you actually loan to the government so that we can feel the effect of the interest rate having a negative, not a, not a positive effect as well. You as a manufacturer, mm -hmm. where a lot of SMEs do fall as well, mm -hmm. what has been, you know, uh, the frustration that they're experiencing accessing financing? or finance, I should say. Fi finance is, 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 like I said, a, big, a very big component, of course, in manufacturing. And in fact, if there's anything a manufacturer requires is long-term funding. Because unlike trading, a manufacturer has to buy the plant, um, at least locate somewhere, then buy the equipment and begin trading. That is it way before they've started the business. Buy the inventory and then actually then, then um, sell off the inventory. So um, we've actually been advocating to have long-term funding financing for a manufacturer with perhaps even some, you know, moratorium. I think the banks are not necessarily hitting back at the government. The mm -hmm. banks have choices where to put their money. You know, if I could lend to an SME at 14%. Fartively, fartively hitting back at the government. Well, I can put it in, I can put it, you know, <laughs> buy, buy government yes. bonds and, and bills and go and play golf. I mean, they have choices where to put their money mm -hmm. because now they're not being allowed to, to, you know, to rate the risk of um, um, the SME. I'm not agreeing that the, rate, the risk of the SME was at the 19, 20% interest that they used to charge. Yes. But um, I guess because they have their, their ceiling and their, and, and their base and their ceiling controlled, they also have um, businesses to run. Yes. But for me, with the results that we saw recently from banks, um, now is when I'm saying perhaps they're making normal profits as opposed to super normal profits mm -hmm. where their return on capital was 21%. I think now it's starting to drop to what is supposed to be globally acceptable at 11%. So it's not like they were not making money. How, how, however, I mean, there's, there's a lot more around the whole capital conversation. For example, we've been, asking, we've been saying in, in, um, um, in manufacturing, could we not use um, pension funds to actually come and support, build like a, you know, either a revolving fund, you know, support the Biashara Bank so that manufacturers can come and borrow in the long term, mm -hmm. not necessarily always running, you know, to a commercial bank. We, we need development banks um, giving a lot more and supporting um, the, the SMEs. But let me give you an interesting analysis that we did um, just the other day with, um, in, well, within KAM. Mm -hmm. We found out it is 58% more expensive to, 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 to do um, manufacturing from your gate to the consumer's hands mm -hmm. in Kenya as opposed to a country in um, Egypt and Vietnam, which we sort of, sort of said perhaps we could be, uh, that are comparable. And where did the 58% 58 of it come from? 20 27% of it is actually on inventory holding. Um, because of um, exactly what he's talking about, there's a lot of unpredictability. Are you going to be here tomorrow? When do you, district, when do you, when do you ho hold my inventory? We tend to find um, the retailers wanting to hold a lot of stock. So they hold um, actually three times the level of stock they would be holding in somewhere like India mm -hmm. or China or even Vietnam and whatever. Why? Because, because again, they don't know, the, the, um, lack, of, um, lack of information mm -hmm. and lack of systems. Trade margins are also very high. Within that 27%, it's a lot of inventory holding and a lot of trade margins. They do, re you know, give me 30% um, return on, on, on whatever I'm pushing for you. Whereas, if you could turn that coin if, you, if, you give me, if I give you a margin of 30%, what am I doing? I'm increasing the cost to the consumer. I could reduce the cost to, to the consumer and turn the coin several times over. Within, within a year, if I could turn that coin 12 times, mm -hmm. as opposed to giving 30% and turning it three times, it makes a big difference. So we need to start educating even the retailers and, and the way business is being done in Kenya on how to turn the coin around. Uh, of the 58%, now there's, there's another one, logistics from port to your gate. 
the logistic costs are actually, you know, astro astronom astronomical. You're talking 12% in Kenya as opposed to 8%. Mm -hmm. You know, and that is just the, you know, the, 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 the multiple charges, you know, tracking, poor roads, infrastructure and mm -hmm. everything. Solution, let's, let's, let's operationalize the SGR a bit better than we expected. Um, we, we, we need to, to actually see the fruits of SGR. The, the, the kind of rates they're giving so far are not working because your, your, your goods are being traded mm -hmm. with three times. You know, you get off the ship on to, onto one mile in, in the Mombasa, then onto the SGR, and again the last mile. So we need to deal with this, um, you know, let me borrow from the energy, the last mile connectivity on both sides mm -hmm. so that you have your goods moving a lot faster. Again, back of the 58%, the, the last one is promotions. You'd be surprised. Um, in Kenya, the cost of promotion, promoting a good to actually um, make the bar or Nick buy it is 13% as opposed to Egypt and um, Egypt and Vietnam where we're doing our comparative study which is 6.5% okay. so what you're doing is you're actually you know you are selling goods but I'm actually charging you to get the goods into your home mm. I, I assume uh, so so um, the solution for this would actually be for um, retailers to actually sit together with manufacturers and take a look and see you know the only person that um, um, earning on this, back to your question, is actually the banker. Mm -hmm. Because what happens? I'm then holding higher stocks. I'm then holding higher working capital. I go to the bank, I have to borrow it from the bank. Mm -hmm. So all that needs to be unpacked. And um, that is an, it, it, it's a conversation that we've started driving at um, KAM. And we are hoping to actually get it because 58%, you must agree, is rather high. And then it doesn't then surprise you that a lot of the, the, the multinationals are actually now choosing to just um, trade in Kenya. You know, let me not manufacture in Kenya, go out and manufacture in um, Egypt and send my goods into mm -hmm. Kenya. Mm -hmm. Creating, of course, a le an unlevel playing field for the few Kenyans who you're born here, you're bred here, and this is what you think. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's come to you, uh, Nick, because also from KEPSA, you have an initiative, uh, we're calling it the Kenya uh, Rising Star, and also, I think, a scale up program as well. In light of also the Big Four agenda that you mentioned, uh, how do you, uh, you know, intend to actually make sure that these particular initiatives, are, they interplay or interface each other in terms of uh, realizing the big, uh, big Four agenda. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the Rising Star program is one targeted on developing businesses from the small micro to the SMEs all the way to the larger businesses. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's a model where the larger companies engage with the smaller who engage with the smaller and pass down skills, uh, think of mentorship, mm -hmm. Uh, and in particular business. And this Rising Star program is, uh, is one that has a different concept, which is to say, let's allow companies to be as large as possible and be as productive as they can. Mm -hmm. There is this interplay, this uh, sort of tension that happens when a company gets too big in Kenya that it has to be shrunk. Mm -hmm. But how do these globally dominating, let me just use those words, these very large companies globally mm -hmm move out of their borders and into the next countries. It's because they're allowed to grow, right? So we must encourage our companies to be as large as possible so that they can grow and expand and continue to create innovation. Mm -hmm. So the Rising Star program is all about that and there's a lot of work with that. When it comes to the big four, the Rising Star program is applicable across all sectors, whether it's in housing, manufacturing, healthcare, mm -hmm. and so on. The, uh, the focus on the big four is very good. Um, the, 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 the challenge we have when we look at the Rising Star program and you map it to the big four yes. is you don't have enough players at each level. Right? Meaning, for example, in healthcare, you don't have large enough providers at the top who can mentor the other ones, but it's coming. As we look at universal healthcare, for example, the, uh, it is possible to achieve universal healthcare. There's technology being used uh, that is finding that there are far more people who are actually capable of uh, paying their own NHIF than uh, than they thought before. So, with the, um, the the initial rollout that you're starting to see across all four, there are a lot of good ideas coming up. We we're just talking about financing manufacturing. Mm -hmm. How do you build affordable housing in Kenya? I can tell you that we can't build affordable housing if we import all of our goods from the east or other places, our doors, our door handles, all of that. We need to start looking at ecosystems and the whole concept of ecosystems in, e in all of the big fours. So you can create an industry, you can create a supply chain, you can reduce the 58% that Flora was talking about by ensuring that if you are actually going to build a house, 
that the doors are made literally a few hundred meters away. The, the metal is formed. The glass is made over there. The, uh, the construction material for the house itself, the wood, all of that industrial should be close. Mm. You have these industrial hubs. Mm. And this is where counties can play, especially when inter-county development. They can say, okay, you are doing the doors, you're doing this, you're doing, whatever it is. Mm. But to procure your materials from another country, mm -hmm. let alone 400 miles away in Kenya, isn't going to allow us to have affordable housing. So that's on the input side. Now when it comes to the uh, financing side, uh, again, we look at that and say, what are we looking to do? Are we looking to have the government fund everybody's house? Or shouldn't we look at it as the government funds or backs up the mortgages, become the, the mortgager, the lender of last resort? Mm -hmm. So that let private sector, let the banks lend to all the people we know who are first time, second time uh, lenders, uh, borrowers, house homeowners, and have the, and have the money the government is raising uh, support. So if that gentleman fails, we will pay the mortgage and you can reduce the risk and therefore the mortgage rates can drop when you're lending to people who are uh, building affordable housing. The other thing I'd say about affordable housing, to go on that tangent, is I think it's very important that we do not copy what they did in England and the States mm -hmm. and other places mm -hmm. and move from shanties to vertical slums. To put 5,000 people at a very low socioeconomic level into um, these towers um, is just going to create all kinds of strange behavior on the 8th floor, the 10th floor, drug, or, there'll be all kinds of things that mm -hmm. are going to go wrong. Mm -hmm. I would say that it would be much better to have um, a sort of socioeconomic development communities where people who are first-time buyers can have more of an aspirational feel in their community as uh, mm -hmm. they can see people up the street. Thank you. So, so there are lots of things to think through on mm -hmm. this, but again, back to the development side. Mm -hmm. We need to have these ecosystems where the small person has a linkage with a large person or large company, and that just keeps recycling. And that's what we're focused on as KEPSA, ensuring the micro SMEs are just as important as the larger companies, and they get a, play, a role to play. Right. Even as we prepare our headline thoughts as we're winding up, maybe if, uh, to you, Flora, each year also uh, we have comes really coming up uh, with, uh, with the manufacturing uh, priority agenda. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you do have for 2018, mm -hmm. and in light of also uh, devolution, mm -hmm. how do you also take con a consideration of devolution in trying to, you know, wrap that in within mm -hmm. this particular uh, agenda that you come up every year with? Okay. I, I mentioned the, the, the five key pillars that yes. we have, which yes. is um, competitiveness, level playing field, you know, a conducive business environment, mm -hmm. focus on SME, and actually, um, you know, driving the future of industry. Mm -hmm. Um, how do we how do we link up with um, um, the devolution is by um, proactive engagement we've reached out to them a lot now we we did last year we went out we mapped out with them um, what are their competitive advantages and what is required to develop and move up their value chains for the ones that needed to move up we then like I mentioned again we did the gubernatorial and um, even now we're going to be uh, large players of course in the devolution conference mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and CAM is opened to actually sit with them and help them capacity build yes. I'll give you an example of what Nick is talking about we call it subcontracting and it is a, a model that has been used in the Asia's and that has also grown industrialization immensely if you have a company like General Motors they, they, they manufacture their buses and stuff yes. the seats do not have to be imported and therefore the local content um, thing you know with a preferential agreement Yes, I can supply them a seat as an SME, but maybe I don't have the capacity or I'll be slightly expensive. But with the, you know, be, with the, being allowed to be slightly expensive a little bit is, is going to then help me and protect me. You then have, um, general, you know, they're able to then capacity build um, SME. So subcontracting is, uh, I guess it's pull, pull, pull everybody up. Mm -hmm. And the more we actually insist on this, yes. and more or less having a little bit of a protectionist um, mm -hmm. um, attitude. I'm not talking around our borders. I mean, it's more about let's buy Kenya, let's build Kenya, being a little bit selfish. Mm -hmm. But in order to, to do that, I, um, I also think we need to be able to, to, to go the long haul. 
um, let's say the government should be saying, like what I'm seeing Tanzania saying, listen, yes. if you want to come and do business in this country, you must invest. And, um, you know, some, of course, the multinationals are saying, no, 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 some, some are going to opt to go away. But that then gives a large market for the local manufacturer to start building his capacity. Because remember, manufacturing to survive needs large markets. Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to make a bold step and say, we, ha we are going to protect ourselves. We are actually going to grow. Um, that also means we're going to have to tighten our borders. And it also means we're going to start having to guarantee markets, not only the, 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 the local, you know, inter-county, inter but also regional markets and inter Africa. I mean, we cannot be, we cannot tell you how excited we are about this, um, you know, pre, um, trade agreement that we've signed with the rest of Africa. But it needs to be operationalized as a matter of urgency because, mm -hmm. you know, the rest of the world right now is looking at Kenya. Mm -hmm. I mean, looking at um, Africa really as the next growth potential. So if we could sort out our issues and actually help A, the local group, B, give a conducive environment to the rest. We will attract, the ones who will run away now during the pain section where we are saying, let's protect ourselves and support the local, mm -hmm. will come back because there will be a larger market and there will be ease of doing business. Right. And, uh, and if I just may add on that yes, point. Briefly. You know, a lot of people get concerned when they hear us even use the word protectionist. Yeah. But um, if you look at it, what we're talking about are just a few sectors mm -hmm. of the economy mm -hmm where we want to focus on the big four in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. It's around textiles, it's mm -hmm. around leather, it's around agro-processing, mm -hmm. uh, it's around construction materials that I was just talking about. Those areas where we are actually growing the raw materials, mm -hmm. raising it from the ground, mm -hmm. where we get cottage industries to grow into large, mm -hmm. that we should focus on. Mm -hmm. There's so, so many other industries that we're not making protection. These TVs, cars, you name it. But let's focus on a few areas and then Thank you. Expand. Right. Uh, we are winding up and uh, just briefly your, cl your closing remarks because uh, we didn't mention about because you have also uh, economic uh, partnership agreements that mm -hmm. uh, and also the extension of facilities like Agoa as well. Mm -hmm. Can we also try and focus this briefly also with you, uh, uh, Nesbitt, in terms of economic special zones? How do these tie in uh, from uh, you know various sectors like KEPSA and CAM? and also IBM and even Melvin T as mm -hmm. well, yes, right? Yes, Just yes. briefly as, we, as we're winding up. Let's begin with you, Anish Oh, Pitt. okay. Uh, briefly. Uh, briefly. These special economic zones uh, used to be called EPZs, these focused trading areas. I think uh, the, they, they're, they're really the embodiment of a public-private partnership. I think it's very important that the counties and the national government focus on these zones, make it very easy for people <laughs> to come in and set up. That means the horizontal infrastructure, the water, the power, gas, whatever it is, they should find um, a, a good way, raising municipal bonds, for example, for those to be laid. So that when somebody's coming in to build and create jobs, they find the infrastructure there, the roads lighting up. Mm -hmm. It's very important, as we were saying earlier, that these ecosystems, these industrial hubs, are created in particular areas close to highways, um, close to the right education, and so on. Because if you don't do that, you're going to make the, you won't get the benefits of the economies of scale. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the work that's been done uh, so far is good. Now it's going to be down to implementation. Implementation. Thank you. Laura. I think he said it all because that is mainly around manufacturing. It is important to have the hub so that um, they're able to sort of work together. Um, and, and also, not to mention that the downstream you'll also create, you know, the services that will be supporting, you know, these hubs around that. There is empirical evidence that shows that industrial hubs actually creating land banks, land banks and in, in industrial parks um, eases the cost of doing business, raises capacity, raises skills and technical knowledge. So all, all, it is a win-win and one of the things we do request a lot of the counties to do for us is actually to designate an area where we are able to, to sort of develop these industrial parks and of course have the special economic, zo special economic zones, you know, allowing um, a lot of foreign investors to come in and not even foreign, I mean it could even be local investors to come in. Thank you. Yeah.